Well, I hope, uh, I, the last few weeks, you know, a few weeks ago we were in Jonah, and then um, we had that uh, deacon ordination service, and we picked up Nahum. So we're in Nahum chapter 2 today. If your Bible looks like this, it's page 1827. If it doesn't look like this, go to Matthew-ish and kind of go left a little bit, five or six books, and you'll bump, bump into Nahum. If you haven't been here uh, last week or if you missed, Nahum means comfort. We just briefly gave some real basic background. Capernaum was village of Nahum uh, or village of comfort. Nehemiah was Nehemiah, the comfort of God. This name, uh, God used an excellent, obviously, name as a prophet to speak to Israel. Israel was under Judah specifically in the south uh, of Israel, modern-day Israel today, was under severe persecution. Assyria, the Assyrian empire of which Nineveh was the capital city, which approximately 75 years earlier Jonah went to, preached out to Nineveh. Nineveh repented of their sins. They turned to the Lord. They made vows. They gave sacrifices. They served the God of Israel, Jehovah. And as time went on, they drifted back into idolatry and to some other issues, some other sins, became a very warrior-type nation, and God turned against them. I think before we start in Nahum chapter 2, it's interesting, I believe, for to set up kind of the, the scene of what's going on. We're not going to read all of 2 Kings chapter 18 and 19, but later today you might want to look at uh, 2 Kings chapter 18 and 19 and read that account. And what it was was Israel had fallen into idolatry. They had King Hezekiah that had come up, destroyed all the foreign gods, got rid of all the idol worship in, in the southern two tribes of Israel. The northern two tribes in 722 had been conquered by Assyria, and the diaspora, or the ten lost tribes, were scattered. Assyria was coming back down through Israel, down to the southern two tribes, and they were at the gates laying siege to Jerusalem, and to the, the southern two tribes left Judah. And King Hezekiah cried out to the Lord. They had messengers that came. And you can read this in 2 Kings 18 and 19. Rob Shakah came down and sent a letter, wrote a letter, and sent it into the, uh, there were messengers, or I wouldn't use the word ambassador, but for our sake today, they were ambassadors from Assyria that went to Judah, and in that letter it said, oh, we have a great king, the great king of Assyria is laying siege to you. And Hezekiah had melted the gold off the altar doors, taken silver, taken gold, tried to pay tribute to being left alone. Assyria said, yes, we're going to take all your wealth, but that's not enough. We're going to take you. And so it said that uh, this messenger came down in the message, you can read in 2 uh, Kings 18, said, we do not need permission from your God to destroy you. I read that and thought, ho, 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 devil. <laughs> you cannot touch a child of God without God's permission. Because I know we read this as Rabasha was saying this from the king of Assyria, but I read this, I know exactly what's going on behind the scenes in the spiritual realm. This is the enemy of God's people saying, we don't need permission from your God to defeat you. Well, I've read Job. And you might recall when Satan went to uh, God and told, hey, what about Job here? And you know, many of you, I've said this, that all of Job was explained in Job 1.1. There was a man in the land of us who was righteous before God. So when people say, how did Job get through all those heartaches and tragedy and loss and family and wife and cattle and wealth and disease on himself, boils, how did he get through all that? Chapter 1, verse 1, he was righteous before God. He kept his focus where it needed to be focused. So interestingly, as I was reading 2 Kings this last week or so, preparing for Nahum, I read that and I thought, here's this king, and the message says, oh, great king, there's a great king of Assyria, and I couldn't help but think as we were singing, what a beautiful name, thinking there was a far greater king on the scene, and it was not the king of Babylon, and it was not the king of Judah, it was the king of kings, Jesus Christ. And not a thing happens without his approval or allowance. So if you're a child of God and you're going through heartache or pain or suffering, I hope today when you leave here, as I said, Nahum's name means comfort. I hope when you leave here today, you are comforted. It doesn't take the pain away, but it realigns that pain to say, but I know there's a king of king that loves me. His name is Jesus Christ, my savior, that cares about me. And nothing can happen without his allowing. Nothing touches us that is not sifted through his hands of love that falls on us. And so I really like it in that second king's Hezekiah said he took that letter uh, that the king had written, that the messenger had given him, and he said he went in to, to the, the, his prayer chamber and he prayed uh, to God. 
And, uh, and as a matter of fact, I want to m- mention also the king had gone, or that those messengers had gone into Judah and told all the people, don't let your king deceive you. And this is a sneaky thing Satan has in our minds. Oh, can God really save you? And so these messengers went into Judah and told the people, don't let King Hezekiah deceive you thinking your God's stronger than our God. You saw how we've conquered all of Babylon over to Persia or modern-day Iran. We came all the way through the Chaldeans, the Medes area, the Persians. We've come down through Israel, Samaria, over into Egypt. We've conquered all these lands and all their gods. But I will tell you today, there is no God like our God. You can conquer whatever God you want because I serve Jehovah. And I know there is no God, the creator of heavens and earth. That's my God. Amen. Anytime, I told you last week that I was in a, talking to a Satan worshiper, and they said, I'm going to pray that you join us. And I said, I'm going to pray that you join my God, and let's see who wins. So we're, I'm going to keep that prayer up. And I told that guy, you're coming to the Lord. Uh, I, I, but I can guarantee I'm not coming to yours, because I know my God's stronger than your God. Amen. And I know that for a fact. And you need to have that for a fact. And when Satan comes and puts that doubt in your mind, oh, don't let your God... And then, as a matter of fact, those after that, then they went to the king and they told Hezekiah, Hezekiah, don't let God, your God trick you into thinking he's stronger than our gods. Folks, I don't care if it's your finances, your health, your marriage, your children, your job, whatever it is, our God reigns. He sits on the throne. There is no harm that comes to his people, no issues, if we will go like Hezekiah said. He took that letter he went into his prayer chamber, and he cried out to God, Oh, dear God, save us. And God said, In your lifetime, Hezekiah, there will be no trouble. That come because of your prayers. I'm going to just flip over real quickly in 2 Kings. You don't have to flip over. I'll just read this one section here. I want to read this. Uh, Isaiah um, says to the king, Isaiah the prophet, this is a contemporary of Nahum. And it, then Isaiah, I'm in 2 Kings 19.20. Then Isaiah, the son of Amos, sent to Hezekiah, saying, Thus saith the Lord, the God of Israel, Because you have prayed to me about Sennacherib, that's the king of Assyria, king of Assyria, I have heard you. I think one of the biggest faults God's people have today and the church has today in the world is we don't drop to our knees in prayer and cry out to God for help. He's standing there with unlimited resources, unlimited power, and we try to solve these problems and dilemmas in our own strength. Well, apart from him, we can do nothing. But specifically, the word says, because you have prayed to me, and I have heard you about this king of Assyria, this is the word that the Lord has spoken against him. And then it goes on, uh, it drops down to verse uh, 26 and 27, 28 specifically. It says, because you're raging, God is now talking to Assyria, because if you're raging against me, And because Assyria, because of your arrogance, has come up to my ears. Can you imagine a human being going to God's people saying, your God's not strong enough to protect you? We're kind of shocked by that. How much shock do you think that puts into God? Maybe not shock, but anger. He says here, because your arrogance, your pride, has come up to my ears, how dare you think you you can attack my people without me getting involved? Because your arrogance has come up to my ears, Therefore, I will put my hook in your nose. That sounds pretty serious, doesn't it? (laughs) God tells the king of Assyria, I'm going to put my hook in your nose, and my bridle will be on your lips, and I will turn you back by the way which you came. That's 2 Kings 18 and 19. That takes us directly to Nahum chapter 2. That's the backdrop of what happens in Nahum chapter 2. And I think as we read Nahum 2, knowing that backdrop, God has said, Assyria, I stand against you. Remember last week he said, I'm going to send an overwhelming flood to destroy you. And this really, to this day, I've been thinking about this week a little bit. That word we saw last week in Nahum chapter 1, he says, I will dig your grave. When God tells a person, a family, a nation, I will dig your grave, other than God's mercy, it's over. Other than dropping and crying out to God for forgiveness and mercy, it is over. There is no coming back from that. And so Nahum chapter 2, God, your, your Bible may, may not, mine has a, a headline, it says the overthrow of Nineveh. This is right out, we just saw from 2 Kings 19, where God says, I will put my hook in your nose, my bridle on your lip, you're done. Nahum chapter 2, the one who scatters has come up against you. And then listen to this, this uh, 
is it, I don't know if it's staccato, is that the word I'm looking for? But this, man the fortress, watch the road, strengthen your back, summon your strength. God says, I, you're going to get wiped out. So you can do whatever you want. Man the fortresses, get the chariots ready, get the horses ready, watch the road, strengthen your back, summon all your strength, Assyria, because it's over. You can do whatever you want. You can make whatever plans and decisions and goals you have. And, and God's almost challenging them. Show us your finest and all your strength, Assyria. Come out full strength. You ever, I guess in Texas we'd say, well, maybe, but you better bring a sack lunch. <laughs> you know, I don't know if you ever heard that one or not. I'll beat you up. Maybe, but you better bring a lunch because you'll be here all day. <laughs> but anyway, so it's kind of God telling Assyria that. You've attacked my people. You better prepare because my wrath is coming. Verse 2, it says, For the Lord will restore the splendor of Jacob like the splendor of Israel, even though the devastators have devastated them and destroyed their vine branches. This is back where I said Israel was already taken out. Judah was in the south. The Assyrian army had come and taken all the wealth and people away from the northern ten tribes. Then they're down into Judah. They've taken the gold off the doors, the silver, the, the crops. The, the, the wealth of Judah has been taken away. But God puts right here in the midst of this passage... Okay, Assyria, you may seem like you have the upper hand right now, and that's where some of us are today. We think this weight or this sorrow or this burden that we're carrying has the upper hand. We might even think, well, the devil's winning. I've heard people say, well, it may be, but right now it seems like the devil's winning. It may seem that way, but I go to verse 2. The Lord will restore the wealth and the splendor of his people. I am, the older I get, the more I see the unsaved world with big houses, big boats, new cars, having the life, and really, and I hope you have the same attitude, I'm happy for them. I'm happy for them because if they continue to reject God, this is the best world they will ever know. If they're here for 50, 60, 70, 80 years, and this all the joy they have is Sunday hitting the lake, because I know their future will not be joyful. If you're a Christian, what's our future look like? This is the worst situation or the worst times for a believer in Christ. This is the best time in life for people to reject him. So let the world have their joy. Eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow you might die. And with that, I'm happy that the, I want the unsaved world, like God does, to come to Christ. But if they reject him and always reject him, go party, because it's the best you'll ever have. You will never have joy. You'll never have happiness. You'll never have any internal happiness whatsoever when you die. For all eternity, it'll be misery. So I, I don't bear them ill will when they have big stuff or boats. I don't, I'm not envious of them. God's grace might even be saying, because I know their future, I'm giving them the, the wealth of this world because they won't have the blessings of heaven. We need to be busy, though, about our Father's business and trying to pull those people to Christ. So verse 2 says, the Lord will restore. So God says, Assyria, you might seem like you have the upper hand now, but Israel and Jacob, Judah, my people, I'll restore everything you've taken away and then some. Everything's coming back. I'm going to restore them. This is the comfort for, for Israel. Those times that you're going through heartache or difficult situations, God says, hey, my people, I will restore. I will restore. I will put back. I'll give you back the splendor. I'll give you back happiness and joy. Don't worry about what it seems like. Don't let your brain lie to you. As, as we saw a moment ago, the letters went to the people and to the king. Don't let your God deceive you. He can't protect you. He can't save you. He can't do anything to you, for you. Well, then you don't know my God. And the devil will plant those thoughts in our heads. Is my God strong enough to get me through this? Is God comfort and peace strong enough? We were saying, what a beautiful name. And I was down here as I was singing that song. I was thinking, everlasting father, prince of peace. Uh, the government will be on his shoulders, Jesus, Yeshua, Messiah, the, 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 the one that saves and the one that's anointed by God, the Holy One of Israel, and all those names I was thinking about Jesus, who he is. And at every one of those names, the name I, one of the, one of the characteristics I love the most about him is Jesus, friend of sinner, because that's me. Thank God I'm a saved sinner. <laughs> but I make no mistakes, I'm a sinner. But I'm saved. Jesus has declared me uh, uh, pure or holy or uh, righteous because of what Jesus Christ did through no good deed in me, 100% of what Jesus did. And if you don't have that confidence in your head today, if you're not sure that God has declared you just because of the death, burial, and resurrection of His Son, Jesus Christ, in a little bit, we're going to have a time of invitation. Make that right today. 
You might say, well, I think back when I was 9 or 10, I walked, I kind of did something like that, or, you know, I was confirmed at birth, or, you know, when I was little, I had some water, or I had all these different things done. That might be good. But if you're sitting there today and you don't say, I know for a fact that my God will give me best days ahead. I know for a fact Jesus died for my sins on the cross, was buried, and rose again. And by that, I am saved, I am healed, I am declared righteous. If you don't know that for a fact today, make that right today. If there's doubts, put those doubts to rest. Because Satan comes in with those doubts. Your God can't save you. Your God can't protect you. Your God can't do what he says. Well, I'm going to flip over here real quick to uh, Romans 8, off j- jumping over there. Paul writes, as it is written, he's quoting Psalm 44, Israel had lost a great battle. We don't know the specific occasion of that battle, but we n- know that... Uh, Israel lost a great battle in Psalm 44 was written, and Paul writes, just as it was written, and he's quoting back to Psalm 44, for your sake, Jesus, for your sake, Jesus, we are put to death all day long. You know God's people suffer death. They suffer the loss of life. They suffer the loss of jobs, health. They suffer all kinds. They suffer like everyone else. Yesterday, we had a celebration of life here, and I had mentioned how in Thessalonians, it says, we do not sorrow or have suffering like the others do. We have a hope. It doesn't say we won't have sorrow and suffering. It says we won't suffer like those with no hope. We have hope. That changes everything. That changes everything. I, even the Greeks came up with that Pandora's box. You know, when they said, don't open it, all these emotions get out. And, and they opened Pandora's box and everything got out. And the one thing that closed it, they, they held on to hope. Even the unsaved Greek mind knows that hope is significant when there's hope. Hey, where's there hope? We have a living hope. His name is Jesus. And this passage goes on, and many of you are familiar with this. It says, we're, although we're put to death all day long, we suffer, we have pain, we feel it. We don't know what tomorrow holds, but as you know the saying, but I know who holds tomorrow. And, and uh, we are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. Sometimes we feel like that, don't we? I think there's times we feel, God, what are, I, I, the world is upside down. What is going on? I, don't, I'm, I feel lost. I feel like a ship at sea crashed in the waves. I don't know what's going on. But Paul goes on to say, through, well, I'll say the Holy Spirit goes on to say through Paul, but in all these things, child of God, we are more than conquerors. And then Paul says, and I want you to be able to say, are you, could you say this? I am convinced. My mind is settled. I don't care what's going on out there. I know what's going on in here. My mind, my emotions, my heart, I am convinced that neither death nor life, nor angels nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God that comes through Jesus Christ our Lord. Are you convinced of that? I am. And Nahum chapter 2 tells, is trying to give Israel that same message saying, be comforted. Our God, Jehovah, is going to restore everything. Nothing can separate you from His love. Does anyone know any Ninevites? Because I know some Jews. This was 2,700 years ago. I, does anyone know any Assyrians, Assyrianites, or Hittites, Amorites? I'm going to have to say it. Mosquito bites. <laughs> Well, I don't know any of those. Well, I know mosquito bites, but the people groups, I don't know of any of them, but I know there's Jews. I know some. And so when God says, I will restore the splendor of Jacob, I had a picture, I can't remember who I showed to, maybe Billy or someone, that picture I was in Lebanon years ago, and, and it's in my office if you want to see it after church. I'm standing in Lebanon, and it is dirt and sand and rock and desert. And if you were to walk over to about this area, I see three strands of barbed wire, and right here is a Star of David flag. That's the border. And right here is grass, and by the time you get to Billy, there's fruit trees. And I look at that picture, and I took that picture one day when I looked at it, and when it says, God will restore the splendor of Israel, and I thought, how can I be in desert here, looking down and saying, I'm at the beach, sand, rock, desert. Not even, maybe little pieces of brown grass over there and over there and over there. It's desert. And as far as I could underhand pitch a rock is a grove of orange trees. Well, I look at that picture saying, there is a God. I just don't get how we can go from orange trees to desert in 30 yards. And right there on that fence line, 
is the Star of David, and God says, I will remember, I will restore. That, that blows my mind, that picture. I look at it often and just stare at it and think, God, thank you for giving your sinful servant that I can see how faithful you are. And I don't have faith in me, but I'm going to ask you to say amen if you say, but I have faith in God. Amen? amen. Yeah, there's times I look at my own life and I say, God, I, I don't have faith in me. And God says, I don't expect you to have faith in you. <laughs> I expect you to have faith in me. And God, we studied James a few months ago, and God says that. He says, count it all joy when you fall into various trials and temptations and challenges, and, because that's to strengthen your faith, not your faith in you. And if you've read that wrong, like, God, I'm going to have faith. I'm going to believe in myself. As long as I believe in myself, I can do all things. Through Christ. You've got it all twisted up. As long as we have faith in God, His anointing spirit will give us power to do whatever God tells us to do. That's what that passage is talking about. Not, well, dear God, I'm going to play this basketball game, but I know I can do all things, so I'm going to be able to dunk a basketball. No, I will never dunk a basketball. <laughs> who's, who's laughing that hard? Is that, Lori? I can, I can hear your laugh through that mask, and I can see you smiling. Get thou behind me, <laughs> Lori. <laughs> But that's the God we serve, the God that says, I will give you power to do whatever I tell you to do. I, I, I was reading, and I wish I could remember the passage. I'm sorry, I was reading this week in the Bible, and I, I love this passage. I'm going to have to look it up again and find exactly its address. It says, when, when Israel went across the Red Sea and that, those waters opened up, it says, God, you're the God that the waters stop. And it said, we followed you through the Red Sea. Those seas opened up because God in the spiritual realm was walking in front of his people, and those waters said, that's God, stop. Back up. Let them walk across on dry land. I wish I could find that passage. I've never seen that till this week. They said they walked across behind the Lord. We know the pillar of fire and the pillar of uh, clouds, but I've never really saw that imagery before that God was walking in front of his people across the Red Sea saying, if you're walking behind me, you've got nothing to fear. I'll, I'll tell the water stop and the water stops. I like in one of the battles where they said, God, we need the sun to stop. And God said, okay, sun stop. How would everything hold together? Well, he's God. And it's interesting, some of you scientists probably know this, but they said that supposedly, and I don't understand all this, but space-time and where the earth is, it says we're about two and a half, three hours behind where the earth should be. I find that amazing when I read those things. I'm like, I remember that story. That's when God told the sun to stop. Why are we, and I don't understand that, how, we're two, how they know we're two hours behind where the earth should be. But I thought that was that day back, I think, in Israel when God told earth, stop spending, sun, you stop. I'm going to give my people daylight because they asked for it. Here we just saw that an entire Assyrian army with all of its wealth and splendor and horses and chariots, Hezekiah, one man, went in, took the letter, dear God, help me. And God said, fine, I'll take that king and I'll put a hook in his nose and a bridle on his lip. I'll let that king know who is the Lord. So verse, uh, chapter 2 goes on to say, uh, verse uh, 3, it says, the shield of his mighty men. This is interesting. If you read this, uh, either in Hebrew, depending on your English translation, it says the shields of his mighty men are colored red. It actually says the shields of his mighty men are made red. So God's telling Nineveh, hey, those shields you have, those shiny shields, they're going to be red pretty soon. Why do you think they're going to be red pretty soon? It's going to be blood. Yeah, your shields that you are proud of, they're about to turn to blood. You, you come out with all your clothes that are scarlet and red. Look at how great we are. Look how safe we are. Look how proud we are. You want red? I'll give you red, is what God's saying here. The chariots are enveloped in flashing steel when they prepare to march. He's showing all the power of Assyria. Look at all their, their chariots are wrapped in steel. They're clad in metal. The cypress spears are brandished. You know, the uh, uh, cypress or the cedars of Lebanon or like maybe we have fir trees where we have big, long fairly straight branches that go out from the center of the tree in a fir tree. And it says they cut those to make spears. And it says you've made your spears ready. Your chariots race madly in the streets. They rush widely in the squares. Their appearance is like torches. It says your, your metal chariots rush around so quick they just see the glinting of the sun. And it, it, just your chariots uh, speak fear into, into other nations, other people. When they see those chariots coming and they would have a uh, kind of a prideful we have so many chariots, as we go into a nation to destroy it, the chariots would put up dust in the air, and you could see them from a ways off and say, was that fire? And it was, no, that's the Assyrian chariots coming for us, that, that dust that they would stir up on the way. That would probably be daunting back then to say there's thousands of chariots, thousands of horses, thousands, hundred, maybe quarter million. In a little, if you go back to 2 Kings uh, 18 and 19 and 20, 
That's actually the story where it says that the Assyrian army came against Israel and God sent one angel. And it says that one angel killed 185,000 Syrian troops in one night. So I don't know how many people they had as warriors, but we know they had almost, they had 185,000 to send just to Judah, to destroy Judah. And if you saw that many people coming with spears and chariots, and the chariots are not just chariots, but they're clad in steel, and, and they ru- they're, they're rushing to and fro quickly like lightning, they're fast horses, it would probably be scary to a lot of people. And, and the Satan will do that to us today. He'll put things out there that we see and hear and will put fear into us. Did God give us a spirit of fear or a spirit of power? And the answer is, if there's going to be salvation for Texas or America or this world, it's going to be through the cross of Christ and that message will be spread through his people. We don't have a spirit of fear. We have a spirit of power. And they rush wildly in their squares. The appearance is like torches. They dash to and fro like lightning flashes. Verse 5, he remembers his nobles. Now you start seeing there's going to be some problems here. There's, there's definitely some uh, foreshadowing when it says there's the horses uh, or the chariots flash around like torches and he picks his elite uh, soldiers. Verse 5, his special forces. He remembers his nobles or his special elite warriors and they stumble as they march. So you start seeing the best Assyria has, God says, I'm going to show you what they really have. They They stumble. Their, their most elite forces begin to stumble and they hurry to the wall and they drop over protective barriers or mantles or shields over the walls to protect their cities. The gates of the river are open. Remember last week we looked where God said, I will open up, uh, I'll over, uh, uh, flood you with an overwhelming flood. Well, above the city of Nineveh, right on the Tigris River, and there was another river of two rivers that come together, the western side of Nineveh, the city, was built right on that river. And they would use that river as a protective uh, guard area. And above the city, up the river, the king had made big giant reservoirs of water. And so as the city needed water, they could open up floodgates and they could let the water down. They could control the water a little bit. And on top of that western wall uh, of Nineveh, they built the palace. So the palace was in the safest place. Basically, they had a river here and said, well, we really can't be attacked over there. If we're going to be attacked, it's going to come from the east. So let's put the palace on the, on the northern wall of the, villa, of the town, right where those water is, so the king can look at the water, what we need, open the floodgates. The, the palace is the safest place possible. Doesn't that seem from a human's understanding wise? Put the, the, the palace in the safest place in the city. It happened to be on the northern west wall, right on the side of that river. And we saw last week from the uh, Chronicles of Babylon, ancient documents, where the uh, leader of Babylon, uh, or Assyria, said how there was one of the greatest storms he'd ever seen come. Well, back to verse 6, it said, the gates of the river are opened. When Babylon came to destroy Assyria, Babylon came to the city of Nineveh and went up river in this great giant flood and said, well, let's just open up the gates. We'll flood the place out. So what Assyria thought was their preparations for safety, and this is what I love how God does. Oh, you thought that was going to save you? I'll use what you put as your strength to be your weakness. And my people who are weak, I'll use their weakness to show my strength. God puts everything opposite of our thinking. So it says here when he said a week last week, I'll flood your village, I'll flood your town with an overwhelming flood, and I'll destroy your palace and it will drop. That northern wall was cut out. It was eroded from when they opened up the floodgates. The wall fell over, the palace collapsed exactly like God said. Fifty years earlier, God said, this is what's going to happen to you, Nineveh. And God followed right through with his plan, regardless of any of their, verse 1, man the fortress, watch the road, strengthen your back, summon all your strength, get ready. All their preparations were a waste of time. God said, what you think I'm going to attack you with, I'll attack you with the water that I created. I don't, need, I don't need to have a fortress or send troops to defeat enemies. And I want you to know that God can defeat your enemies in the spiritual realm. But we need to go to Him in the spiritual realm. We can't just sit around talking all the time about, well, I got this problem, and I got that problem, and I got headaches and this aches. And I get it, we all do. But take those to the Lord like Hezekiah did. He said he took that letter from that ambassador, went into the prayer closet, and cried out to his God for help. And, we, and I read it in 2 Kings where God said, because you prayed, I was moved to action. It's our prayers that will move our God to action. 
So verse uh, 7, it says, it is fixed. Or, or your translation might say, it is decreed. And basically what God's saying here is, when I said I'd wipe you out, it, it's, it's as good as done. It is fixed. My Bible has that word fixed, and your Bible might be the word decreed. Both of those are past tense. When God says, when I say something, I treat it as already happened. Isn't that amazing we have a God like that? What I said, put it in the bank. It's happened. It is done. It is fixed. It is decreed. Nineveh is stripped. She is carried away. Her handmaids are moaning like the sound of doves beating on their breast. Though Nineveh was like, here's like a, a simile. God says, although Nineveh was like a pool of water, and all this water came in and wealth, and all the wealth of the world, that whole region of the Middle East, all that wealth all poured in to Nineveh. Nineveh was a great city. We know that from Jonah. Remember Jonah said, the great city Nineveh, and all the wealth that Nineveh had, and all the opulence that they had. Uh, it said all the wealth of that area flowed in like a pool. It was a collector throughout all her days. Now they are fleeing. As the wealth was, as that pool collected, God said, I'm going to put a drain in the bottom of all that water, of all that wealth, of everything you have. There's a drain in the bottom, and it's just going to disappear overnight. And it says, as people were yelling in the streets of Nineveh, stop, stop. No one listened. No one turned back. No one changed their ways. Verse 9, as, as Babylon now is conquering Assyria, plunder the silver, plunder the gold. Wow, that's, that's, that's mind-boggling, is it? There's no limit to the treasures. Tons of gold, tons of silver. And if you think about when Solomon's day, you may recall that it said they counted the gold. And when, if you look up that account, when they asked Solomon, how much silver do you have? Silver is like water. I mean, who counts water? I mean, so all that wealth had been taken by Assyria just from one nation. So much silver and gold. So who, who can even count? You can't count it. It's, it's uncountable. That's how much wealth they had. But it said all that is unlimited, verse 9. Wealth from every kind of desirable object. Nineveh, in verse 10, is empty. So that big pool of water, God put a drain in. Nineveh is emptied. Yes, she is desolate and waste. Those words there in uh, verse 10, it's uh, empty, a place of emptiness, or wasted away. You don't pick it up really quick in English, so I'm slowing down. She's emptied. Yes, she is desolate. And she has laid waste. There's nothing left of this great city. I, I put here in my notes, um, boy, now I wish I could find them easy. Psalm 127.1, and many of you will know this, maybe not the address, but you'll know the, the words. Unless the Lord builds the house, the builders labor in vain. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the guards stand watch in vain. And that's exactly what we see here with Nineveh. This is proof, proof in the pudding, as Gideon likes to say. God said, man your gates, guard your roads, watch the towers, put all your people out, but I'm not watching over your city anymore. I've turned you over. Now it's not mercy and grace, now it's justice and judgment. And folks, John, you hit it, the nail on the head today, and I mentioned this last week, I don't think the world or we can fully appreciate God's mercy or good news unless we fully appreciate His judgment and bad news. Without Jesus Christ, eternity in hell forever, with no hope. That's bad news. But the gift of God is Jesus Christ. And you can have eternal life through that gift. That's good news. That, that's, I understand that mercy. And when I start thinking about His judgment, I, th I think someone can help me here. I think it was Thomas Jefferson. I was reading uh, something this week where he said, I can't help but tremble when I know that we serve a just God and His justice will not sleep forever. Well, that was 240-some years ago in this nation. Folks, that weighs on me too. I can't help but look at this city of Houston and our nation and the world and think, we have a just God. Yes, He's merciful, but He's also just. And I can't help but think of His justice and not tremble when I look at this world and the sins of this world and realize that God's justice will not rest forever. This day of grace that we're in, one day God's going to close that door so we need to be busy working while we have daylight, while we have sunshine, while we're able to work, because the day's going to come when we can't work anymore. God's going to take that door and close it, and mercy's done. And all hell will break loose on this world. So verse 8, though Nineveh was like, uh, I'm sorry, verse 10, she is emptied, yes, she is desolate and waste. 
Hearts are melting. Look at these warriors. Do you think two years ago these warriors had this feeling? Hearts are melting and knees are knocking. They are terrified. Also, anguish is in their entire body. Verse 10, it says, There's confusion was sent to Assyria, fear was sent, and mental illness filled the vacuum of the wealth and the power of Nineveh. God said, I'm going to take away all these things you take pride in, and in that vacuum that I take away and drain, I'm going to replace them with confusion, with fear, and with mental illnesses. That, that sounds very familiar to where we are today, folks. This, I tell people all the time, don't, I, I, who, who was alive during the 70s and the 80s? I love those days. Everything was easy, no problems. Many of you know I said I was born in Chicago. I remember an eight-year-old kid getting on my bike at 8 o'clock in the morning on a Saturday. My mom and dad saying, be home when the streetlights come on. What happened? No one would let their eight-year-old kid now go out 13, 14 hours in South Chicago. No, but I hope not. I don't let them do it here in Houston. I don't let my 27-year-old daughter go places without, where are you? What are you doing? I'll track your phone. Yeah. Don't, don't, Kat, I hope you're not watching. Well, I hope you are watching, but. I pay the bill. I'm going to know where my phones are <laughs> that I allow them to use. <laughs> yeah, they're my phones. <laughs> but anyway, so, uh, but that's the world we live in. I think, what happened to those times that used to be so easy? Boy, now it's just, I, I look at people and I talk to people and I talk to a mental health expert this week, Miss um, Robertson, and uh, she has said, I, I, I have never been busier in my life than I have in the last three, four, five, six years. It is Mental health issues have exploded across this nation. There's no hope. And I mentioned this a few weeks ago. The American Psychiatric uh, Association said people that don't take drugs need to start and people that take them need to take more. Th that's the wisdom of this world. But folks, we have a living hope. We have a hope in Jesus Christ. We have an answer. We have the answer this world is desperately crying out for. That's the answer. And then it goes on to close here where the den of the lions and the feeding place of the young lions are. And what it's saying here is it's making an allegory or allusion to the young lions are in the words pasture. They're in the pasture, and the young lions see the adult lions tearing flesh, eating flesh, killing things. And while that might be appropriate for lions, it is not appropriate for people. So this allusion that makes to the young lions of Nineveh, the children see this violence, and the children grow up in a world of violence, and they're becoming violenter and violenter. It's becoming common for them to see violence. It says, we're the dens of the lions and the feeding place of the young lions, and the feeding place is these fields. And it said they saw their, how their parents were behaving, the young lions were behaving just like the parents were behaving. And, it's, and, uh, and it, with, uh, with nothing to disturb them. They were saying, we can kill and pillage and murder and do whatever we want with no recourse because there's no justice. There's no, we don't got to worry about God's justice. We can do what we want. There's nothing that's going to disturb us. Well, folks, one day when God comes back, there's going to be disturbance on this earth. The lion tore enough. In verse 12, it says, the lion, the Nineveh, people of Nineveh tore enough for his cubs. And it said Nineveh would pride themselves on taking captives from other lands, bringing them into the city, and publicly torturing them, skinning them alive, taking their skins off while the person was alive, and drying them out on their city gates, showing, look how strong we are. These people, we can kill them, or we can skin them alive. We don't even have to kill them. We just want them to be tortured in pain, and the kids are seeing this, and that next generation coming up beyond this generation says, to them it's just common to live like this. Amen. Folks, I can't help but read this and not think, we're there. We're right there. Kids today do stuff that 20 years ago would have shocked us if an adult did it. Now, kids are doing this, well, that's, what are you going to do? Give them some more medicine to help them. They need Christ is what they need. It said they killed enough and they filled their lairs with prey and, the, and uh, his dens was to torn with flesh. So it said it was like the people of Nineveh acted like lions, killing, murdering, eating, filling up their, their wealth with just trampling over other nations and other, other people. In verse 13, chilling verse, much like the one that last week said, I will overflood you and I will dig your grave. Verse 13 says, behold, I the Lord am against you, declares the Lord of hosts. And that Lord of hosts is Jehovah Shabbat. It's Lord of heavenly's armies. We just saw a moment ago, I referred to 2 Kings, one angel wiped out 185,000 troops. When God comes with 10,000 times 10,000 times 10,000, the host of heaven, what hope does this world have on that day? And I'll tell you, there is no hope on that day. 
it's over. So that should spur us, it should spur his people to work, to diligently work. I mentioned this a month ago when God says, when Jesus said in the New Testament, look into the fields or white into harvest. He doesn't say pray that those people come in. Pray that those sinners come into the house and beg forgiveness. What he does say is pray to the Lord of harvest. And uh, does anyone remember what it says? What is the prayer? Pray to the Lord of harvest that he will send forth laborers. There's none that seeks righteous, no, not one. Folks, they're not going to come in here and say, well, I'm a sinner. I decided to come in. We got to go get them. Pray to the Lord of the harvest. He sends forth labors into the world to save those people that he loves. Behold, but anyway, here now the doors close and God says to Nineveh, behold, Nineveh, king sent a cherub, I stand against you, declares the Lord of hosts. Remember earlier it said your chariots fly around like lightning and torches? God says, I will burn up her chariots. You, you say they run around like Lord, uh, fiery steel? I'll show you fire. I will burn your chariots and they will become dust. They will become smoke. What well, you took pride in? I will burn them up in smoke. The sword, you took pride in your military conquest and you're murdering other villages and towns and nations and women and men, women and children. I'll send a sword that will divide your children. Your children will suffer. You made other nations suffer and you took pride of it. I'll take what you took as prideful and I'll do it to you. I will devour your young lions, your children. I will cut you off from the prey of the land. Nineveh was like, look at all this. We're like a pool of water. All the wealth comes in. Everything we want comes here. God says, I will make it where there's nothing left in the land for you to take. I will cut off your prey from the land. You'll have nothing to eat anymore. Your dens will be empty. And no longer will the voice of your messengers be heard. Remember I said back in 2 Kings, the messenger or ambassador, there's two things they would use messengers for. One would be go to another kingdom and take letters from the king and tell the king of this other area, here's the message from King Sennacherib in Assyria that says, yield, drop your wall defenses, give us tribute, give us money, or we will kill you. And those messengers would go out with that message throughout the region. And as they started conquering places after place after place, it would make people's knees turn to water. I think I told you some years ago, I was riding to Sturgis with some buddies, and an 18-wheeler ran me off the road, and I, I dropped down a hill probably from the, that, where the roof touches the wall, about that far down to the floor on a motorcycle. I was going about 70. Praise God, I was fine. But when I got up, my friend Bobby Bowersock said, Dale, are you okay? And I got up the hill, and I said, yeah. He said, look down. Folks, I didn't know it. My right leg was doing this <laughs> from adrenaline. And he said, are you okay? Yeah, I'm fine. I literally been so scared, I didn't even know my knee was moving, and it was bouncing all over the place. You okay? I'm fine. You got some adrenaline? A little bit, but I'm good. Look down. Oh, my. I couldn't stop my leg from bouncing. And uh, so when it says here, when God says, I will uh, get your knees knocking in verse 10, that is a real fear. You can be so afraid that you, your body starts convulsing of fear. Satan, give us your worst because I know who God is. You're not him. We don't, we don't have to fear the devil. We want to we understand his power and his tricks and how he can tri trip us up and trap us. But we don't have to have a fear. Folks, we need to be the church that when we wake up, I love that t-shirt that says, I'm the Christian. When I put my feet on the ground in the morning or something, the devil says, uh oh, he's up again, or she's up again. We better be ready. We're in a battle. Sometimes we feel like that, don't we? God, the devil's got me beat up and beat down and broken down, and I'm, a, I'm just worried. Well, folks, God says, I'm the God that you need to tell the devil, devil, you need to be worried. He, I've said this before, God, Satan may remind you of your past, and when he does that, I love saying, Satan, I'm going to remind you of your future. I know where you're going, right back here in Revelation. How's that pit feel, Satan? Because that's, that's what's coming to you. I know it's coming to you because my God said it. Jehovah said it. Well, it won't be too long when you start talking like that and knowing that in your head. It says, ooh, better res he's resisting me. What does James tell us? When you resist the devil, what's he do? He'll flee from you. Not just to, ah, I lost today. He's going, oh, my goodness. That Christian gets it. That's a, that's a warrior of God. That's what we all need to become as we grow together, we lift one another, we encourage one another towards that thing. So the messenger would go out and they would herald to other kingdoms, you better give up or else. And they would come back to the king Hey, king, and they would holler in the streets. King, look what this nation's given us. And they would holler out their message of, look how much this nation and that nation has given us tribute and monies and, and uh, allegiance. 
And God here says, and no longer will the voice of your messengers be heard. You'll never hear those people again bragging on some nation that fell, or never again will your people go out to another nation and tell them to yield, because Nineveh, you'll be wiped out. And folks, as I mentioned a few weeks ago, if you study historically Nineveh, there are no Assyrians or Ninevites left. When God said, I will destroy you utterly, he meant it. I, I know we went a little long today, I'm sorry, but I wanted to get that second Kings, I want to put that understanding of what this name, chapter 2, is going on, the background of it. So we are going to go to our time as our uh, praise team comes up. Folks, this, this message from the Lord, I hope, has been encouraging to you and comforting. We have an awesome God. There's no God like Jehovah. Behold, He comes, riding on the clouds. That's who we serve. If you don't know for a fact that you're saved, this is the day of salvation. Come to that Savior today. I know I did back on July 14, 1986, I believe. I know I came. Will you? God bless you.